Andy, how are you, man? Living the dream as always. <laughs> Good to know. Um, I just want to start off by asking about uh, Jason Bean and his his running ability. He was even more effective at Coastal than he was in week one, it seemed. Um, I, where would this offense be without kind of that dynamic he's, he's bringing for you guys? Well, you know, he obviously brings, as you commented, his running ability. But I think one of the – I don't want to say undervalued in all of football, but the – the hidden yardage of quarterback scrambling and taking off for first downs and whatever the situation might be is something that, you know, a lot of people call hidden yardage. And for us to be able to have that stuff, it just helps a ton, right? As we're building this thing to be able to get, you know, first downs any way that, that we can or necessary, um, having something that you maybe necessarily wouldn't plan for, right? With his ability to scramble on pass plays is, that's just, that's just a bonus, right? It just, it just helps a ton. Uh, but to your point a little bit, I mean, him having the threat of running is something that, you know, defense is going to have to prepare and scheme for, um, you know, to, how do you contain him, right? Which in theory should kind of help out and alleviate some stress on some of the other positions. What, what's your assessment of the, the O-line play in week two? Uh, where do you all need to improve? What did you like? Well, you know, I think the biggest thing that we talked about improving all week is making, you know, our physicality. And that goes for everybody in the box, not just the offensive line. Um, Right, you know, our ability to kind of fall forward as ball carriers. We challenged the guys last week. I thought they started moving in that direction, um, you know, between the backs, the tight ends, and the offensive line to be able to, you know, we call a run play in first and 10. We want that thing to be efficient, not have to make second or 11 calls. Um, you know, the sacks that we had, uh, you know, given up, when you look at them, they were all in predictable situations. And the number one thing that you need to do to prevent stacks is prevent being in predictable situations. Okay, and so... Uh, that's the first thing that you do to, to, to fix those errors. Cause it's easy to look at the stat line and say, you gave up X number of sacks, you know, and point the fingers at the offensive line or whoever it might be. Um, but <clears throat> the reality is we gotta do a better job on first and second down to make sure we're staying out of third and long. Okay. And I know that sounds um, rudimentary, but it's the truth. It's reality. And so we need to be able to do that. Um, and then w what have you all done well to kind of avoid turnovers the, the first couple of weeks? That's, you guys have been playing pretty clean, it seems. Well, you know, it's been a big emphasis for us. Um, I'm, I'm sure I've, at some point in this process here, Coach Leipold had, had talked or discussed, you know, um, in a situation where in the last five years, you know, there, no one has turned the ball over more than, than, than Kansas. And we want to we fix that. We want to prevent that. And so it's a daily emphasis. It's a daily uh, thing that we drill, offense versus defense. Um, we do things in practice to promote, you know, carrying the football correctly. We do things in practice to promote catching it, tucking away correctly. Um, and it's just a, it's a con consistent emphasis in our program. So um, that's what we do daily, I guess, to, to address it. And it's a credit to a lot of our kids so far to understand that and buy into that, you know, because it's easy to talk about things like ball security. It's easy to talk about things about whatever, first down conversions or red zones or third down conversions, all those sort of things statistically that jump up on the Madden screen or across the stat line, right? The first things that show up in the play-by-play. -play. It's not sexy to talk about ball security, sir. You know what I mean? It's not sexy to talk about how you chin a football, right? Uh, it's not. And it, 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 is, it requires some, some discipline and it requires discipline to talk about it all the time. And, it, and it's, a, it's a credit to our kids for understanding that, you know? And when someone at practice says chin it, um, everyone knows what we're meaning, you know, and they, and they do that. What do you make of the offense being able to convert some explosive plays last week? Well, it's one of the big indicators of winning football games. So it certainly is helpful. Um, it's obviously not the result we wanted last week, but any chance that you can rip off plays of more than 20 yards, you're, you're just increasing your percentage of having scoring drives immensely. Um, and again, some of those came, uh, as we talked about before, you know, like with Jason's running ability, some of those came off of, um, you know, you know, guys making plays. Um, however they occur, you know, we want them to, to occur. So it's a credit to the kids and their speed and the things that they're doing. Uh, we went into the game. We talked about trying to be intentional about our explosive plays. And then to get a couple that you don't plan for, like a quarterback scramble, <clears throat> again, it's just added bonus. It's a it's – a, um, you know, it's fun to watch, right, <laughs> for everybody. But it, but uh, um, it just there, there, there's a ton of stats that suggest, you know, just on scoring drives. If you have one play over 20 yards, you know, I think you become, I think it's almost 70 percent, 
you know, likelihood of scoring a touchdown. If you have two, it's like 90 or something like that. I, I have to look at it what, exactly what they are, but they're important and we need to be intentional about them because a lot of times, sometimes they just don't happen naturally, right? And how do you feel like the execution of wide zone has played out so far? Um, it needs to improve for sure. And it's something that we'll continue to emphasis, emphasize throughout um, the season, the week, because it's something that's going to get going. I think you've had, we've had a little more success on maybe some of the things that complement it. And we have the things that the actual play itself, but it won't stop being an emphasis here. You know, we will still be able to, we're still going to continue to coach it and rep it because in the terms of our long-term success, that's going to be critical. That will be, that will. And, um, uh, but it is going to, it, it has been improving. I think um, they got, and certainly the understanding of it has been, we just got to get to the situation where we're executing at a higher level. And Andy, last uh, one. Oh, go ahead. All right, last one for me. Just what have you seen from from Baylor's defense in preparation? Well, you see them. You know, they're they can be a pretty multiple group. They kind of base out of a three four front, but they slide it out of four man um, looks. You see an athletic group of linebackers, really uh, pretty twitchy group of guys, guys who are really disruptive um, and do a good job of of creating disruption in the backfield or undue pressure on ball carriers or linemen. Um, you know, I, I, I don't want to rattle off what they are statistically, what they've been, but they've been pretty solid, you know, as you would expect from that group. Um, but not dissimilar from last week, you see some experience in spots that helps them get lined up correctly and help them, um, you know, make the right calls. And, and, you know, there's not a lot of things that quote unquote get them, you know, uh, but you can see their experience and their ability to execute on film for sure. Andy, I'm really going to quiz you here, so your memory, so good luck, I guess. Um, All right. You talked about the improvement on the, the wide zone. Devin talked a little bit about a carry out of the 50. He got kind of ankle tackled. Uh, it was a four-yard gain, but it looked like you guys had maybe blocked it up about as well as you had. Um, I guess you is that part of the improvement you're talking about, a play like that where um, it didn't quite get the yards you wanted, but you're looking on film and you're saying, hey, hey, this is closer to what I, I see? Yeah. When And I think I said this last week. It's exactly what I'm talking about, Jesse. It, when you talk, I think I said last, we talked about just being like one block or one guy away from it being a big or an explosive or an efficient play, whatever the situation is. You know, uh, it is, that's it. And we talk about in our offense, I mean, all the time about that, that, that is the difference. It's one block. It's one technique of a block. It's one, um, whatever, one extra step on a route. That, that, is, that is truly the difference between executing and not. And we're in the never ending quest to eliminate that, right? To close that gap in this program. Um, so that's, that is what I'm talking about in terms of that's it right there. If we just don't get, you know, if the, if the tackle just hangs on a little bit longer and if the back just press a little bit more on some holes, if we just identify that front a little bit cleaner, some of those negative run plays will, will go away and they'll be efficient. And that goes back to what we talked about staying out of predictable situations so you can stay out of, um, moments where your offensive line is exposed or can be exposed, you know, and they're in a situation where it's just hard for them to go out there and execute. Are you still seeing flashes on like plays like that where, Hey, this is what I saw at Buffalo. Some of these blocks, some of these combo blocks hitting the linebackers, those sorts of things. Yeah. 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 You do. Yeah. That you, you, you kind of have those feelings. And again, you try not to make a ton of comparisons to where you had been before that way. But um, you know, as you have success in certain aspects of a game, as you're alluding to here about, you know, running the football, you know what it looks like. You know what it's supposed to look like. And, and our staff has been doing it long enough in all areas of the game. And we're, I know we're talking about the, the, the stretch play here, but, I mean, it, it goes into throwing four verticals. It goes into throwing quick game. And, and we know what it's supposed to look like, and we do as much as we can to show the kids and, and, and just continually to emphasize some of those details to the guys. Hey, Andy, I know there's been some talk about when you guys got hired, you've taken a look at the big 12 and, and, and kind of trying to have a head start on, on breaking some things down and whatnot. I, I was wondering, not specific to Baylor necessarily, but since you're starting big 12 play this week, what, what jumped out at you about this conference and, and, and what, what it takes to su succeed offensively? Um, you know, I, I don't know if I would say that it's exclusive to this league, but I really believe that teams that are winning games and playing championship level football, they have the ability, they obviously have athletes on the football field. And so you can see that in this league, right? You can see there's athletes on both sides of the ball that are running around. But I think the teams that are finding a way to be consistently good, which is what we're striving to be here, is they find a way to play physical football and still look 
sexy and finesse like. Yeah, you, you made that analogy. Does that make sense to you guys, right? You think about high successful teams, they still find a way to play physical football. And that's something that we're going to continue to, to emphasize here. So <clears throat> to to I guess specifically within the league, when I started watching and you start looking at all the good teams and you start looking at offensive teams that are having success and you're looking at, you know, versus our opponents in the league and you start looking at, you know, what are the common traits that some of the best offenses have? Um, that's a, that's a component. Obviously there's good athletes running around the football field, right? There are great running backs, linemen, quarterbacks, receivers, et cetera. But you see teams that are finding a way to allow their kids to play physical and fast, right? I'm not talking about just playing tempo fast, but just, they understand what they're doing and why they're doing it allows them to come off the ball a little bit faster. And yeah. that's done through repetition. It really is. Makes sense. How, how quickly did you jump into studying the league and, and, you know, roughly how much time did you spend on it before you even got down here? Oh man. I mean, were you burning the midnight oil? I mean, was it one of those? Yeah, well, or? yeah. I mean, we, you know, uh, I, I'm just trying to think of a specific timeline for it. After, you know, if we said, Hey, let's we're, we're going to, you know, we're going to KU. I mean, it was pretty fast. Right. You know, right. I mean, like right away. Um, just to start to evaluate what you see in the league defensively and, you know, from a schematic standpoint, because the personnel will always change and you make the assumption that everybody you play is good and they have good personnel. Um, and then you spend time spending, you know, watching, you know, Kansas film and, and thinking about that personnel and what you have and how it would fit. Uh, but it happens pretty quick and frequently. I mean, we spent time in the summer game planning every opponent. Um, you know, we spent time as an offensive staff, I want to say probably into that second or third week together. Uh, just sitting down game planning, watching every opponent that we had together and start talking and kind of going through some, I call mock game weeks to get us ready to, to kind of prepare for them. But as I've said before, you know, week to week, uh, your team and your opponent's team, it, it evolves, it changes based off of whatever it might be. You know, it could be things you can't control like injuries and weather. It could be things that you can't control like, hey, the development of a certain position group or a certain player that needs to be highlighted more or on the defensive side, something that we have to protect against. Um, you know, and that's why you still have to be able to kind of take it week to week, game to game. Great. Thank you. Hey, Andy, I was wondering when you guys went in to this fall camp, you probably had some quarterback run game ideas and things like that. But now that you've seen what Jason's done, have you found yourself going back and saying, all right, we got to incorporate some more or trying to get more creative with it? Yeah, I think, uh, yes. To answer your question, I, I think, that goes to a little bit of what I had said before about how every week, you know, you evolve and you grow and you start to look at your personnel and say, we have to find more creative ways, staying within the system of things that we do right without having to reinvent yourself completely. Uh, because then you start to compromise maybe on things that you've trained your players for all fall camp, but more creative ways to say, here's how we're going to highlight a, a player, you know, and I know you're referencing Jason, you know, and that you can talk about that, you know, as, as our season goes on, I bet five or six weeks from now, we might be talking about other players and what are other ways that we're finding um, creative ways to get them involved in the, in the, in the game. Right. So, but well, we do, uh, you go into fall camp and you say, you look at the personnel and you say, you know, there's some athletics athleticism at the quarterback room. We need to be able to start implementing some of the QB run game, you know, schemes, um, however far into camp it was. Um, and then as you get into camp, you see more and more with those guys, because I've talked about before, there's some depth at that position, especially from an athletic standpoint. So you can, you can start to scheme it up a little bit more, you know, and not, and again, it has to stay kind of within the framework of things that you're doing. Though. Thank you. Andy, when Jason went down uh, last week, all, you know, it was only for a play, but when he went down, y'all went with Jalen, I guess, why did Jalen get that nod over miles in that situation? Well, it probably just goes back to maybe, you know, being able to carry on with some of the same things in the, you know, in the game plan that, that we had had. Um, it's not a discredit by any means to, um, you know, Miles, I, I think I would just, and I would just be remiss to not comment about how I'm, I'm very proud of how Jalen and Miles have, have handled it. It is really, really challenging for a young man, you know, from the ages of 18, 22 to compete and not be named a starter. Right. And that's true at any position, but especially one that has the highlight on them, like, like those two guys did, um, you know, how positive they've been with each other, how they're, they still, because Jalen and, and Miles have both played. And so they understand that, in this game that, you know, your role can change at the snap of a finger. You're one play away, as we say, and they've, they've stayed very engaged. They've stayed very uh, supportive. You know, they're coming back. They're giving feedback to Jason. 
you know, and Jason's listening to him. And so there's some trust there that goes on in the room. And I like that a lot, but, but Jalen went out there. Cause you know, as the week went on, he had a, he had a pretty solid, you know, pretty good week of practice to show that he had the opportunity to get out there and, and, and play in that position. Thank you. We got time for one more. We good. All right. Well, thanks guys. I appreciate you. Thanks coach. Thanks Andy.